In this lecture, we're going to predict a pure rotational spectrum for a molecule like HCl, which has a permanent dipole moment. This is going to be kind of a long lecture, actually, and so we are um, going to have to take care of a lot of things. So I'm just going to make this one standalone recording all by itself. We can go ahead and we can make our life easier, and we can just say, let's ignore um, centrifugal distortion. So our equation is going to look something like this for the energy levels. We know that B is h bar squared over 2i. And uh, we know that J can take values from 0 to infinity in steps of 1. Uh, we also have our selection rule we saw. Delta J can only change by one unit. And uh, we have to just really either decide uh, absorptions or emissions. So it's absorption, then it's going to go up by one unit. If it's an emission, it's going to go down by one unit. And if we're going to gather everything together, you know, I mean, H bar is what we'd expect it to be, H over 2 pi. And the moment of inertia is the effective or the reduced mass times r squared. And the effective mass or the reduced mass for a diatomic. So for a diatomic, we're perfectly correct to call it a reduced mass. For a polyatomic, effective mass is probably the preferred term. It's just the product of the masses over the sum of the masses. And what was r again? r is the distance between the two atoms. And so of a diatomic molecule, there is just a single distance here we need to, to worry about. We still need some more information, actually, in this problem. So uh, we need to actually specify exactly the molecule we're looking at. Well, what do you mean, right? I mean, I said HCl in the title, right? Is that not enough information? Well, it turns out that hydrogen and chlorine both have several different isotopes. So we need to actually specify which isotopes we're looking at. So for hydrogen, the vast majority, over 99% of all the atoms are hydrogen 1. So we can probably assume hydrogen is always hydrogen 1. But chlorine has a approximately a 3 to 1 ratio of chlorine 35 to chlorine 37. So we're actually going to look at the chlorine 35 isotope, the one that 3 quarters of the HCl molecules would be expected to contain. Although we could also do run the calculation for chlorine 37 if we wanted to. What's kind of interesting is that this is a molecule where we have specified the isotopes and we refer to this as an isotopomer. So we've got the individual isotopes and uh, if you like we've got different possibilities. We could have used deuterium, we could have used chlorine 37 or chlorine 36 if it exists and uh, so those would almost be isomers of the molecule that only depend on the isotopes. So we call them isotopomers. So this is one of the isotopomers uh, but there's many other ones, of course. Uh, we need, I suppose, the uh, bond length. Um, sometimes we can actually calculate the bond length from this information. But since we're predicting the spectrum, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what it is. It is 127.4 picometers. Uh, or if you prefer, that's 1.274 angstroms. Or uh, if you like, 0 0.1274 nanometers if you're an SI nerd. So one of the things we need to do, right, is to calculate the reduced or the effective mass. We know the uh, effective mass is the mass of each atom multiplied together. So we've got the uh, isotope hydrogen 1, and we've got the isotope chlorine 35 on the tippy top, and on the bottom we're summing them together. So the mass of hydrogen 1 plus the mass of chlorine 35. You might go ahead and say, well, that's pretty easy. Those masses are 1 AMU and 35 AMU, and uh, you would be close, but not exact. So we can go ahead and look these up in our CRC handbook. And again, the CRC handbook will give you way too many significant figures. So we can go ahead and we can just go ahead and take uh, three or four decimal places or so. So 1.008 and 34.969. And on the bottom right, we're just going to reproduce those. We're just summing them together. We can see that the units are going to be units of atomic mass units. So on the top, they would be squared. On the bottom, they would be by themselves. And so uh, that gives us one atomic mass unit um, times by a number. So we need to probably convert into kilograms. And um, we can look up the atomic mass unit. It is 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 of a kilogram. And that gives us the uh, reduced, I'm sorry, the effective mass for our isotopomer, which my calculator tells me is 1.6269 times 10 to the negative 27 of a kilogram. So that turns out to be ever so slightly smaller than the mass of just hydrogen 1 by itself, 
which is why sometimes we refer to these as reduced masses. What are we going to do with the reduced mass now, So, uh, or the effective mass? There I go again. We're going to use it to calculate the moment of inertia. So it's uh, mu times by r squared. So we've got uh, mu already on the line above, so I can just go ahead and copy it and just drag it down, and we have r squared. So we said r was that very small number, right, 127.4 picometers, so 127.4. Uh, what is pico? Pico means times 10 to the minus 12, so we can just go ahead and make a direct substitution there. And we're squaring it all. So if we go ahead and run that on our calculator, uh, we get something that is kind of an ugly number, I suppose, 2.6. Four zero five six. That's probably too many significant figures there. We probably can't go past that fourth one there, I suppose. And uh, times ten to a very small number, uh, minus forty seven. In the units, we've got kilograms and we've got length squared, so it'll be kilograms meter squared. So with our moment of inertia, we can use it to calculate the rotational constant. So b. B is h bar squared over 2i. I think Atkins um, derives it ever so slightly differently. This has units of energy. This is actually my preferred way to write B. We've got h bar squared. So uh, h bar is just uh, h over 2 pi. And we square it. And we've got twice the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia we just calculated to be uh, that very small number, I suppose. Not small if you're a molecule, but uh, 2.64056 uh, times 10 to the minus 47 and that had units of kilogram uh, meter squared. And because we've used SI units for everything here, we're going to end up with SI units for energy. So energy has units of joules, so it'll be 2.105797 uh, times by 10 to the minus 22 of a joule. So a very small number. Well, energy. So now we can go ahead and predict the pure rotational spectrum and absorption spectrum. We know the fundamental equation we're using is the energy depends on the quantum number j, and uh, the relationship here is b times by j, j plus 1. Uh, remember our selection rule said delta j has to go either up or down by one value, and we can use this to our advantage here. So we can go ahead and uh, set this up. So we've got two energy levels. We're going to call the lower one J, so J is any value, 0, 1, 2, 3. And for absorption, then we know that we can go up by one value of J, so we've got J plus 1 in our upper state. And uh, what's going to happen here for an absorption experiment, right? We're going to jump from the lower level to the higher level, and uh, that is going to be uh, when we supply an energy um, of a photon that exactly matches that energy gap. So we can set this up, right? So we can say delta E is going to be the energy of the photon, so we know that's h nu, and it's going to be equal to the energy of the upper level, so j plus 1, minus the energy of the lower level, j. So uh, this is the beautiful thing. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say that is uh, new absorption, just to remind me what's going on here. So I can go ahead then and say that h times by the absorption frequency is going to be e j plus 1, so that is b times by, okay, well, instead of j, right, we've got j plus 1. So there's j plus 1, and there is j plus 1 plus 1. Okay, so i got to be a little bit careful here. And I'm going to go ahead and subtract away from that the energy when it's in quantum number j. So that's b times by j, j plus 1. And so we can simplify that expression, right? So we can notice that there is a b in factor in the first and the last term. So we can just draw it up front. We've got j plus 1, j plus 2. That is j squared plus 2, oh, sorry, 3j plus 2. And the second term then would be uh, j, j plus 1. So that's j squared plus j. And we can cancel some terms out there. That j squared, right, is the same before and after. We're subtracting off 1j from 3j, so that leaves us with 2j, and that gives us a total of b times by 2j plus 2. Or if you prefer, right, we can bring that factor of 2 out and write that as 2 times by b times by j plus 1. So that's equal to h nu for absorption. So now we get to see the spectrum. So we have said that h nu for the uh, absorption is equal to 2 times by b times by j plus 1. So maybe we're just interested in the frequency of absorption. So we can just say that's 2 
times by b over h times by j plus 1. And here is, unfortunately, the ugly truth behind my b. So I picked my b in units of energy, and I thought the expressions were quite nice. But Atkins actually picks his b in units of frequency. And so in Atkins, he just writes b for b over h. So this is one of these sort of uh, dirty, uh, uh, unwritten truths that uh, you'll probably pick up over time is that we often just use B for everything, actually, and just assume if you're working with frequency, it's the frequency B. If it's energy, it's the energy B. If it's wave numbers, it's the wave number B. But uh, you'll probably see that later, I'm guessing. In graduate school, perhaps, right, John? Or Ben? Or Dylan? Or whoever else is going on to graduate school? So let's go ahead and plot out this spectrum. So we can go ahead and we can draw a horizontal axis. And this can be our absorption frequency and we can take values of j. So we know that j can take values from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 all the way to infinity if we can get there. So obviously uh, the um, um, lowest absorption we can get is at a frequency of 0, so we can go ahead and pop that there. And let's go ahead and take values of j now. So if uh, j is 1, that is going to give us, uh, let's see, so it'll be 2 times by this all nonsense times by 0 plus 1. So it'll be at a frequency of 2b over h. So we can write that on our spectrum. So uh, there we go. So we have 2b over h. It's going to be a nice line in the spectrum right there. And it's going to correspond, if you like, to uh, the 0 to 1 transition. And we can go on up the numbers. And so if we take uh, j as 1, then uh, essentially uh, we can calculate the frequency. So if j is 1, we're going to have 2 times by b over h times by 2. So that is an energy, I'm sorry, a frequency of 4b over h. So 4b over h. And uh, that's our line in the spectrum. So we let to j equals 1 be here. It was an absorption, so we're transitioning from 1 to 2. We can go ahead and we can do the next one. So if j is 2, and we calculate what we get here for our frequency. So j is 2, so it'll be 3 times by 2. So it'll be 6 times by b over h. So we can see a pattern here. So this will be 6b over h. The next one will actually be 8b over h. The one after that will be 10b over h. And what are they coming from? So we've got those lines here and here and here, these nice skinny stick lines. So we said this was j equals 2. It was an absorption, so it was going from 2 to 3. Our selection rule, remember, says it can only go up by one unit for an absorption. So if we're starting at 2, we're going to 3. And this one, we're starting at 3, and we're going to 4. And this one, we're starting at 4 and going to 5, and so forth. So this is the pure absorption spectrum for a rotational transition. And what you notice when you see this is essentially you've got a horizontal ladder, right? So you've got something that looks like a cone. And the spacing is exactly the same. So this spacing here is identical. And it is a 2b over h spacing here in our spectrum. So that is something you get to recognize after a while. So we'll come back and we'll look at this idea in a bit. But we started out by asking ourselves about the uh, hydrogen chloride molecule, right? So we said, what would the spectrum look like for hydrogen chloride? So we should probably go ahead and calculate exactly where this first line is, calculate the frequency, and then if we want the other lines right, we basically just add it another time and another time and another time to reproduce the spectrum. So now we can plug in what we have, I think, from uh, before. So we got 2, and B we calculated to be 2.105797, right, with uh, way too many significant figures, times 10 to the minus 22 of a joule and h right is Planck's constant so 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds we can see that our units here are going to be uh, seconds to the minus 1 and I make that 6.3562 times 10 to the 11 seconds to the minus 1 are also known as Hertz so that is our frequency that we would see it at so uh, that's kind of a large number isn't it so 10 to the 9 would be giga, so that would be 635.6 gigahertz. Now, personally, I am a lambda man, so uh, um, we need to maybe convert to wavelength to get a better feel for that. So let's uh, pull up a new slide and have a go. 
So we can convert a frequency to a wavelength. We remember c equals nu lambda. So if we want lambda, right, that is c over nu. c is our speed of light, so 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And our frequency we just calculated, right, so it was 6.3562 times 10 to the 11. So I think those numbers are just way too large, right? So uh, very hard for me to wrap my head around. So we can calculate wavelength. I get 4.7167 times 10 to the minus 4 of a meter. So we can rewrite that actually and say that's 472 times 10 to the minus 6. So 472 micrometers. And that turns out to be in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Actually, technically, I think it's just barely in the far infrared, but most of these are actually in the microwave part of the spectrum. And because most of these transitions are in the microwavable spectrum, we normally go ahead and refer to microwave spectroscopy. Okay, as rotational spectroscopy. So whenever we are measuring microwave transitions, we are actually looking at the molecules absorbing I was going to say light, maybe electromagnetic spectrum, and are increasing and decreasing their rotational quantum states. So rotational spectroscopy is microwave spectroscopy. We're so used to infrared spectroscopy as vibrational spectroscopy. We're used to UV vis spectroscopy as electronic spectroscopy. So uh, the uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum is associated with a particular kind of transition, and microwaves are great at kicking rotational transitions. So to kind of backtrack there, you probably will start to recognize these pure rotational spectra as uh, these lines that have this constant spacing between that we set is equal to 2b over h in frequency units. So it looks just like a comb. So we start to recognize, there's actually a gap there at zero, of course, but we start to recognize these kind of comb-like spectra. And we can actually look into space, and we can measure pure rotational spectra, and we can start to recognize them. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a quick paper here by Harry Croto. And this is a paper we have access to through OhioLink. This is from the International Reviews in Physical Chem 1981. And it talks about the spectra of interstellar molecules. So we can actually look out into the interstellar medium. And we can uh, sometimes deduce what is out there by looking at these pure rotational spectra, these microwave spectra. And uh, we can figure out from the spacing that uh, we have a rotational spectrum. And we can learn about the bond lengths and identities of the molecules in the interstellar medium. Now, Harry Croto, you might recognize that name, or if you don't recognize that name, you should probably uh, keep it in your memory banks. He was one of the two discoverers of the buckyball. In fact, I went to uh, graduate school with a student who uh, did his undergraduate research with Harry Croto, and they were basically shining lasers at, I believe, graphite surfaces. And the graphite would actually kind of pucker off the surface and roll up and form a buckyball. And they were actually investigating these kind of processes that they would expect to, I believe, occur in the outside of a red giant of a star. And actually, here's a figure from their paper. This is a pure rotational spectrum for carbon monoxide. And you can see here, so these are actually in wave numbers units. We, we kind of like wave numbers. We'll have to convert here in a bit. But we can see a series of peaks that look like a comb, a very jagged comb. And we can see that they have a fairly constant spacing apart. And that means that this is, is super easy to identify as a rotational spectrum. You may wonder why I keep using the term pure. Well, we'll see later that nothing's that pure, actually. So although you can induce a rotation, it normally actually piggybacks on top of a vibration. And for molecules, if we hit them with enough energy, they will piggyback on top of an electronic transition. So it's kind of unusual just to get pure rotational spectrum, to be honest.